Okay, so we're going to continue with our Life of Try series. We're about halfway through this now. How are we doing with this? Okay, so our premise is we believe that God wants to draw us into what we call kingdom activity. He wants to use us to bring about his love and his grace and his story to the people around us. Christianity is unique because we're the only religion whose instigator didn't die. Yeah? The instigator of Christianity died but rose again, and he lives on by his spirit. And we felt his spirit this morning after worshiping with that sense of God's presence being with us, that sense of God's peace and God's weight being with us. And what we're trying to do with this series, Life of Tries, we're trying to partner with that spirit activity on a day-to-day basis because we get to be Jesus' hands and feet. He left us behind to basically be his hands and feet upon the earth. And whether it's through things like CAP, uh, which started many years ago by somebody who's responding to God's prompting, and now we see the fruit of that in that video, you and I can respond to God. But it takes something... It takes trying. It's not based on success or failure. It's based upon you and I partnering with the Holy Spirit. And we've said the only real real failure that we can kind of succumb to is the failure to try. Because we're all called to try with God. And we've looked over the past few weeks, haven't we, how fear of failure can stop us trying with God. How, um, How the fact that we don't make trying habitual, it doesn't form part of our natural lives, we don't get to do it. And last week, Jake looked at how rejection, the fear of rejection from other people can prevent us from stepping out with God. Because we're all worried about what people think about us, aren't we? Yes, we are. Okay. Today, I'm going to look at how actually responding to God little by little helps us keep in step with God, helps us hear God's voice more clearly. When we're in motion with God, when we're in step with God, then we can discern God's voice more easily. So I'm going to start by looking at a passage from Acts, and it's a passage we've looked at before. It's the story of the disciple Philip being sent by the Holy Spirit to meet somebody, meet an Ethiopian. These people were in two different places, and God sort of sent them to conjoin and meet together uh, for a a Holy Spirit moment, a gospel opportunity. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 8. I'll put, put the words on the screen for you. This is from Acts chapter 8, reading from Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, right, so straight off the bat, that sounds very grand, doesn't it? Yeah, big angel, white wings, eight foot tall, appears to him in his room and says, you must do this. I don't think that's how it happened, okay? I think he probably had a nudge from the Holy Spirit. So don't let the fact you haven't seen an angel disqualify you, all right? You want to see an angel? Not today. Okay, so, so God says to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before it shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. What I love about this story is that it starts with this kind of breadcrumb trail that the Holy Spirit puts out to Philip. The Holy Spirit starts by saying to Philip, go south to the road. Now, everyone knows that stories need beginnings, don't they? Stories need starts. We don't get a story unless we've got a beginning. And the beginning of this story is that the Holy Spirit nudges Philip to go to a desert road. And one of the keys for you and I in responding to God's activity in our life is responding to those little nudges of the Holy Spirit. They come to us all the time in different ways. And the trick for us is how do we respond to them? They can be like a little breadcrumb trail. We need to take the first breadcrumb and then move on to the next. Now, Philip's got no idea 
why God is sending him to a desert road. Doesn't sound very attractive, does it? Go to the desert. You know, don't go to a big city, don't go to a big event, don't go to a happening place, go to the desert. And Philip's got no idea why God is sending him out to the desert. But he starts out, he starts out from Samaria where he was, he starts out towards the desert road. He was trying to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes God will speak to you and he'll speak to me and he'll say something to us that doesn't make a lot of sense initially. And being humans, what we want to do, we want to know the end of the story, don't we? Who flicks the end of a book? Do you? I'm very naughty. We want to know the end of the story, don't we? We, 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 we? we binge watch Netflix series now. We don't have to wait until the weeks go by. We can literally watch the whole thing in a matter of hours because we're desperate to get through to the story and know what happens. But sometimes living a life of try means that we have to step out when we don't know what the story is going to be, how it's going to unfold, what the ending's going to be. And sometimes God will say to you or say to me, go somewhere that doesn't look very attractive. Go and do something on the face of it doesn't look like it's very sensible or very meaningful. Go to the desert road. Go to a place where I'm going to do something, but you can't see around the corner. You don't know what I'm going to do yet. You see, if we don't respond to these Holy Spirit nudges, then we never get the stories. Who loves a good story? We love the drama, don't we? We love the, the drama of the characters and the ebbs and flows and the tension and the, all the things they go through. We love to read a good story. We're wired for stories. That's why we love them so much. We love good stories. But many of us would rather watch a story or read a story than live a story. Because to live a story, we have to step out into the unknown. And if we don't ever step out, we don't ever begin that breadcrumb trail, then we don't get the story. We don't discover the kingdom opportunity that's waiting for us. But Philip, he sets out. He sets out with this little piece of information, go to south, go to the desert road. So he travels south from Samaria down to the desert road. And as he does so, he intersects someone who's traveling from Jerusalem. And this guy is an Ethiopian. He's a eunuch. He's basically an official. He's traveled to Jerusalem to worship probably to inquire, to see what the temple's like in Jerusalem. He's probably inquisitive about faith. He's been to Jerusalem. He's had lots of people with him, a big caravan train, because he's an important person. And now that caravan train was making its way back home. He was traveling west. And God sends Philip to intersect with him. And you have this wonderful moment of intersection where Philip and this Ethiopian meet. They converge. And God loves to do this with us. He loves to set us on an intercept course. And the problem we have as humans is we want to know what we're intercepting, what we're going to, where's the destination. But God often keeps that bit to one side. He sets us off on a breadcrumb trail and says, will you respond to me in this initial moment? Will you go to the desert road? Will you go to where I'm sending you? You see, the problem with us as humans is we want to know the whole story, don't we, before we start out. Yeah? Yeah? We want to know where we're going, what we're going to be doing, what the itinerary is, what the points are, one to ten. We want to know the whole story. We're, we're wired for certainty. We want to know because we're risk averse. We don't want to be heading off into the unknown. You and I, we want all the wise answers, don't, don't we, before we set off. That's just human nature. And I think evil attacks God's purposes in our lives by really exaggerating this need for certainty. We struggle with vagueness, don't we? We struggle with uncertainty. And so evil comes and exaggerates that and says, look, you, you just don't know what you're doing, do you? You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you, you don't, you, so much uncertainty and vagueness in your life. You're going to fail. You need to know the, the answers before you set out. I mean, you don't know what's waiting for you. And evil exaggerates that vagueness and our desire for certainty. And it paralyzes us from responding to God because we want to know all the answers before we're prepared to move. Because if we don't know the answers, you're bound to fail. And we know none of us want to fail, do we? And so we're paralyzed into inactivity and evil preys on that desire for certainty and exaggerates the unknowns. The only thing Philip had to trust when he set out from Samaria was that God had the other side of the story covered. 
God knew what he was doing. God had the other things covered. But we sometimes want to play God. We want all the things known, all the things covered in our lives, and then we'll set out, and then we'll respond to God's leading. But Philip didn't have the answers. He set out. He tried to respond to the Spirit. When God began to speak to Keely and I back in 2014 about having a new assignment for our lives, we had a lot of vagueness. We had a lot of uncertainty. All we had was this sense that God was moving us to do something new. Like a bit of a, a changing of the wind in our spirits. We knew something was emerging. So we began to pray and seek God. And over the days and months and weeks, God began to reveal little bits to us. And one of the things he spoke to us was out of Isaiah, the very book that this Ethiopian was reading from all those years ago. He led us to Isaiah 42. And it says this, Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. So God gave us a whisper that we were heading to the coast. We were heading to the sea. And that's all he said at that point in time. Great. We've got a large coastland around our islands. Where are we going? We had a clue. We had a breadcrumb from the Holy Spirit. At the same time, this church was looking for a new pastor. Chris Isard was retiring. They were looking for a new pastor to come in and take over from Chris. Little did they know they were seeking one and they get two. Congratulations. So, so we were vectoring in from the Midlands and at the same time this church was looking for a new pastor. And God brought those two pieces together. But we had so much vagueness, so much uncertainty in our lives. We can remember sitting down, we were going to put our house on the market but we didn't know where we were going. We said, what are we going to tell the neighbours? You've put your house up for sale. Where are you moving to? We don't know. There was so much uncertainty, so much vagueness, but we knew we had to move forward with the nudges that God was giving us. And we converged, didn't we? That gospel opportunity, because we both converged and responded to what the Holy Spirit was saying. But you see, evil will prevent you from moving forward in God because you don't have all the answers. And what that will cause in your life is delay. Evil doesn't say to you, don't do it. Evil just says to you, don't do it today. Put it off until tomorrow. Wait. And we lose the purpose of God in our lives by minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years. And I've spoken to people who've looked back over their lives and thought, I only wish I'd done this. I only wish I'd responded to this. I only wish I'd stepped out in this way. So that vagueness, that delay, and the other thing that can really happen to you and I is distraction. Distraction. There are 101 things you can do rather than respond to God in your life. There are more things than ever now you can turn to, you can, you can do. There's so much distraction we face. Jesus talked about, didn't he, the seed of the gospel, the seed of the kingdom being sown and it falling in different places in different ways. And one of those seeds, even though it fell on good soil and began to grow up, it was choked. Jesus said choked by worries and wealth and the desire for other things. And there's so much in our life now that can distract us from the purposes of God, the things that God wants to draw you and I into. So many distractions. In your life, there can be one moment in a day to respond to God and 101 other ways that you can do things or respond. See, it's tempting to think when we don't see much of God in our lives, what we need to do is pray more, or, or behave better, or be more holy, or know our Bibles better. I would say, put it to you this morning, that if you want to see more of God in your life, how about a little bit of trying, a bit of responding to those nudges of the Holy Spirit? Because we serve a living God. We serve a God who lives by his spirit amongst us. We don't serve a book. We don't serve a religion. We re we we're in relationship with the spirit. And what he's trying to do is draw you and I into that kingdom life. He's trying to nudge us into godly activity. So perhaps we just need to get better at trying. Amen? Back to Philip. So Philip's gone intersected with this Ethiopian and now he's a man in motion he's, he's, he's kind of tracking with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit says to him go and stand close to that chariot 
Go up to the chariot, get close to it. You see, what Kingdom Trine does, it puts us in motion. It puts us in motion with God, in step with God. It says in the scripture, try and keep in step with the Spirit. And so Jesus said, follow me. All these are dynamic terms. Christians have been very good over the years, have just been plonking themselves down somewhere and saying, I'm going to defend this square of turf here. That's my job. But actually, the gospel tells us that we're in motion with God. We respond to God. We follow Jesus. We keep in step with the Spirit. And now Philip's in step with the Spirit, and the Spirit says to him, go and stand close to that chariot. Go and get close to that man. And when we're in motion with God, you and I can respond to God more easily. We hear God's voice more easily than when we're static. You see, a space rocket doesn't need guidance when it's sitting on the launch pad, does it? It needs all those complicated, sophisticated guidance systems when it's in flight. And many people I've spoken to over the years, they want God to speak to them. They want to know God's purposes for their life. They want to know what God's going to say to them. But they're sitting on the launch pad. They've never gone forward with God. They've never put their lives into motion. You see, in a life of try, you're in motion with the Holy Spirit. You're responding to the Spirit in the best way you can. And as you respond to God, you get better at hearing his voice, at discerning what it looks like and what it sounds like to live a life in relationship with him. If you're just parked on the launch pad, then you've got no need for guidance. You've got no need to hear the voice of the Lord. You've got no need to him to speak into your life and give you direction because you're not going anywhere. It's hard to listen to God. It's hard to recognize God's voice when you've no need to. I say to Kitty, back in those years when we were trying to figure out where we were going, but probably the best years for us because we had to lean so hard into what God was saying. And sometimes we get comfortable at not having to do that because our lives are all okay. We're, we're, we're fixed. We're static. We're happy where we are. We don't need to develop that, that ability to listen to the Spirit. Philip's a man in motion. He's tuned into the Holy Spirit. He's gone to the desert road. Now he gets close to the chariot. And he, respond, he hears what this guy is reading. He hears he's reading from the book of Isaiah, an ancient prophet. And like most people who read the Bible, he doesn't understand it. Because it's hard. It's difficult. He's saying he's the guy talking about himself. He's talking about God. Have you ever opened Isaiah? Tricky book. Tricky book to understand. And he's struggling to understand it. But because Philip has responded to the Holy Spirit, he's right next to him. And Philip can say to him, do you understand what you're reading? And now comes this wonderful gospel opportunity. How can I unless someone explains it to me? How can I? This man was trying to seek after faith. He was trying to understand God. He was trying to figure out what these holy scriptures were saying. He needed someone to come alongside him and explain it to him. What if Philip had just parked himself in Samaria? So God, you think I'm going to a desert road? You're joking. I'm quite happy here. Why would I want to go there? But Philip responded to God little by little, step by step, and now he's perfectly placed to tell this man all about the good news of Jesus. This beautiful gospel opportunity because he was a man in motion. You see, Philip had no idea what the end of the story was, did he, when he started out? He didn't know about this man, he didn't know about his journey, he didn't know this man was seeking, trying to understand. He just responded to the Holy Spirit's leading. And you and I can sit static on the launch pad of our lives, wishing God would speak to us, wishing God would do something for us. But God says, will you respond to the little nudge, the little breadcrumb trail that I'm putting out before you? Will you start to follow me? That's what the disciples had to do all those years ago. They left their nets, their fishing boats, to begin to follow Jesus. There were no promises. There were no con foregone conclusions. Jesus just said, will you, will you follow me? Will you go the direction I'm heading. And it's in our human nature, guys, to want more clarity, to want more certainty, to want everything sewn up before we move out. But that's just not how it works. It's, it's, it's an illusion to think we can control our lives, to think everything is fixed. Everything is in motion. You're on a planet in motion, you're in a universe that's in motion, you're in a galaxy that's in motion, everything's in motion. Nothing is fixed. But we get to do the journey with God by his Holy Spirit. And as we put ourselves in motion, I guarantee you will discern God's voice more clearly and more easily. The flip side of that 
is if you stay static, I guarantee you, you will be mired down in fear and uncertainty. That's what happens. There's no middle ground, I'm sorry to say, in this life. If you stay static, you will be mired down in uncertainty and fear. Moving forward with God takes courage. But as you keep in step with the Spirit, you sense that, that move of God in your life. You sense that, that plan of God in your life. You won't know what's around the corner. You won't know all the answers, but you will be a person in motion. And that's what a life of try looks like. Let's stand together if you're able. I can remember in my own faith journey wanting all the answers before I would, I would respond to God. I'm quite a person who likes to get things sewn up. So I can remember my own faith journey wanting to know all the answers, wanting to prove God existed in my own head before I was prepared to step towards him. And he spoke to me one day. He said, you'll not be able to do that. I remember his voice clearly. He said to me, you won't be able to research enough about me to know with certainty that I exist. You have to take a step of faith towards me. And that's what I had to do. Because God was bigger than my mental ability to contain him. I put everything else nicely in boxes. At 21, 22, I had the whole thing sewn up. I knew it all. Got it all boxed in nicely. Then God said, I'm bigger than that. I'm, I'm, and you'll need to take a step of faith, a breadcrumb towards me. And that's what I did. And that was back in 1989. And that changed the course of my life. So if you're here this morning and you're uncertain about God or you're uncertain about faith, all I encourage you to do is respond to what God is saying to you this morning. What's that breadcrumb that he's putting in front of you? What's that little nudge he's giving you? Because to respond to Jesus is to be authentic and in relationship, not in religion. So, you know, what, what is it he's saying to you? Let's close our eyes and let's just allow his voice to speak to us this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're alive by your spirit. And you come and fill your church. So Lord, would you speak a unique word to each one of us this morning? What do we need to hear from you this morning? What are you saying to us, God? What's the truth you want us to hear? That's going to be different for each one of us. God knows your situation. He knows you intimately. He knows everything about you. He loves you. Speak your word, Lord, into our lives. And as God speaks truth to you, you might want to just partner with that. You might want to say, yes, Lord, I receive that. I'm going to, I'm going to receive that. I'm going to trust that that's your word for me today. And I'm going to try and live out of that word this week. I'm going to try to respond to that. I'm going to try and put that into motion this week. Whatever that looks like for me, Lord, I'm going to try and put that into motion in my life. Because I want to keep in step with your spirit. God may be leading you to a place that looks obscure. He may be leading you to do something, to act in a way that's contrary to what you might think. But let his spirit speak to you. I think for some of you, God's asking you to go to people. Reconciliation, something to do with having a conversation with somebody. And for some of you, you're at a fork in the road. You don't, you don't know which way to go. Lord, I just pray you make it clear, God. Just, just make it clear, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we get to try with you. We get to keep in step with you. We get to walk with you because you're alive by your spirit. This is not a journey we face alone. So, Lord, I just pray this week for little opportunities, little nudges, that we can partner with. We thank you, Jesus. We give our yes to you, Lord, in whatever capacity we can this morning. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. It's been great to spend time with you this morning. Good to see you. and look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.